Hello everybody, this is War Story Video Vlog. And here is a Bill. And uh, I would ask him about some of his items here in a Baltimore military antique show. Hello, Bill. Hi, good to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. And uh, could you explain about some of your items here on uh, your table? Uh, there is a lot of uh, good stuff. Yeah, variety. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you explain about the first, uh, about the... Yeah, it's a, it's a Deutschland Erwachen uh, pole, pole top for the Deutschland Erwachen standard. It's actually the nicest one I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. um, interesting story behind it. It was found in a wall um, wrapped in a sheet in a house that, that was being remodeled in the Bronx. In the where? In the Bronx, New, New York, Bronx. New York City. Um, and the people contacted me and I actually ended up buying it from another person from them people. So there was kind of a middleman, yeah. Um, but these are quite rare. I think there are only about 850, 875 of these were actually made and issued. They were made by a company called Otto Gar, who were premier, uh, they were they were silversmiths. Um, that's the company name right there. They were silversmiths and they made all of like, they made the SS honor rings uh, and a lot of Hitler's personal silverware, silver items. Um, and they'll always be dated 23 and then they say Otto Gar on the back. And that's one of one of my nicer German items. And the, the, how much is it? Um, Thirty-four thousand oh, dollars. That's interesting. And uh, how often do you see in the market? Um, I've personally owned. This is the second or third one of these that I've owned in uh, like twenty-five years. Very impressive. Yeah, trophy. yeah. The gilding yes. is actually really, really. You can see a little bit of tarnishing where the lacquer is still mostly intact over the gilding. I think they gilded it and then they lacquered it to preserve the, the gilding, the color of the gilding. Um, and it's important to say that uh, this item is a very good trophy. It's not, some, yeah. not, not about supporting Nazis no, or not something at all. like not that. At all. Uh, it's, a really it's a historically significant yes. item. Because uh, vet, maybe yeah. veteran, he, he, American veteran, yeah. Bring back. And it was important to him, mm -hmm. and it ended up being in a wall, wrapped yeah. up in a sheet. So you know who knows what the story is there, but that's that's long lost. The people that were remodeling the house actually found mm -hmm. it, and that's indirectly who I bought it through. Um, okay. But we also deal with uh, Japanese antique swords. Um, it's a Taiwanese official. Um, they call them. Uh, Japanese territory or Japanese uh, provincial dirks and there were various ones uh, this one is for Formosa or Taiwan um, they had them for uh, China um, they had them for Manchuria specifically and uh, Siam at the time which is which is um, uh, and then uh, I think Asia Southeast Asia they had different there were many, many different, you know, mm -hmm. territory dirks, but this particular dirk is the nicest one I've ever seen. Because mm -hmm. um, gilding, the are... gilding is is perfect, virtually perfect. Uh, a lot of them have black handles where the same is dyed black. This one has a white handle, which mm -hmm. was probably a special order uh, piece. And then the blade is is also just extremely extremely mint um, yeah, looks, looks perfect you know and then on these particular dirks a lot of times they'll have the manufacturer the maker of the fittings will have a stamp this one I believe is SA um, I'd have to look up what no, there, uh, what Arsenal there, made them but some yes, of them there is yeah some of them were made by soya uh, there were different companies that made these. Mm -hmm. And you could, 
you could order them. And I say, what does it mean? Uh, uh, it's the company, yeah. But there were several manufacturers. But this is this is about a, as deluxe. Yes. Yeah, as a Dirk as you could find. You know, all of the all of the highlights are chased, mm -hmm. burnished. You know, um, and then the gilding is just extremely, extremely nice. Um, the ray skin scabbards in perfect condition. Um, and and just, uh, it uh, looks like traditional Japanese. Yeah, uh, like a Japanese navy. Dirt. And you have several, mm -hmm. several Japanese. Yeah, dirks. many, many. Um, yes. Could and you they, explain about uh, these dukes one by one, maybe? Uh, sure. So this is this is the earliest pattern of the Japanese navy dirk. Um, oldest part, the the they, oldest pattern. It's called an 1883 pattern. Um, similar to the 1883 pattern navy sword. Mm -hmm. um, and these were, you know, these were pretty neat how they made them. These flowers are actually separate pieces that are applied to the scabbard. So they, they basically, later on, they got away from having these, these appli application of these separate flowers. Um, and then they changed from the boar's eye pattern to mm -hmm. um, a later pattern, which has a solid, a solid top. So this is a later pattern. Um, so you can you can actually see the difference in the cutouts, where the where the top piece, the kashira, is, is mm -hmm. uh, has a. A cutout piece in the center, um, you know, and you can you can see the difference in the style. But they're both navy dirks. I just bought this one next door table, and uh, what do you think about this? Oh, the gilding is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the nicest one that I've seen. Um, I was actually on my way over to buy it mm -hmm. um, when when Alex was buying it. Um, but the blade is perfect. Um, and uh, in my opinion, it's a handmade blade. Yeah, it's a handmade blade, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see the, the temper line, the hamon, um, where a lot of times they'll have an etched mm -hmm. faux temper line. But the gilding is the, the gilding is still real frosty. You just, I mean, this is, this is 125 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and this one is model uh, 1883 nine? pattern uh -huh. navy. So it would have been it would have been worn during the Russo-Japanese War. And the same model here on your table. Yep. This one is an army, and the way you can tell an army from a navy, obviously the scabbard's a little bit different. But on the handle on the armies, they have this little bump down with the with the cherry blossom in it where the navies are just straight across on the D-guard. And this is also a Russo-Japanese war um, period blade. But you can see the difference in the D-guard and in the scabbards. Navies are typically worn with two hangers, cutting edge down, Tachi style they call it. Um, and the armies are typically worn katana style with the cutting edge up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but this is this one's exceptional. It really is. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Could you explain about your swords one by one, please? Sure, sure. Um, with Japanese Japanese swords are a little unique in that you can have World War II era mounts, but a lot of times you'll have uh, traditionally made or even sometimes older swords that they remounted for the war. Um, and on here you've got. You know, Russo-Japanese War Army. Um, Russo-Japanese War is uh, Kyugunto. Yeah. Um, the army is the the the, uh, the the Gunto. These are these are both armies. These these three are uh, World War Two era blades, but traditionally made. This is a a late war kind of a rare variant of a Type 44 mount, but army. Mm -hmm. A lot of and, people. Uh, very interesting thing here. Uh, very interesting detail is a cover for the handle. Yeah, rarely. A lot of times these covers are lost or destroyed. 
It's only one I, I've seen here in Baltimore show. And so this was a combat cover. This protected the silk wrapped handle, mm -hmm. the Ito, in the jungle. Um, sometimes you'll see them with cloth wrapped over. Mm -hmm. But this fits down over and covers the tsuba and fits tight, basically pr protecting the sword from foul weather, foul weather cover. Mm -hmm. Um, so often they'll have these combat covers on them, um, and some more army swords. Here's a here's a World War II Japanese Navy, a Kai Gunto. Um, this one has an older blade. Um, this particular blade's from the 1600s. Um, not in full polish, but it's decent. You can see it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so here you have an example one, of one that has a blade that's several hundred years old. How much is it? I don't have the price on it, but it's like twenty five, twenty eight hundred. I'd have to look at my book here mm -hmm. number. Um, and it's papered. I, I submitted it for a paper for the the. There's a couple of groups that come to the U.S. every year. Yeah, so every couple of years they come and they do papers you know, do an appraisal and sort of tell you what it is. They don't give a value, but they tell you the school that they think it is um, and the period it's from. Um, and a lot of times we know what that is. If you study Japanese swords, swords fit into categories, you know, type mm -hmm. of hamon, grain style, um, and you can determine the school and the age. Um, this particular sword is, is a koto blade. It's, an, again, an army mount but really minty Gunto mounts, early style mounts with the smooth painted scabbard. Um, this blade was was made about 1550. This was mm. signed. But quite old. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this was a family heirloom that the, the soldier brought with him to fight in war. And the Japanese used these swords. They actually used them. But again, the gilding is quite quite good on it there's some scuffs on the blade but overall it's it's pretty good the condition mm -hmm. but it's important uh, how do you put it on the scabbard and how yeah. you yeah yeah there's a proper way to handle them never touch the blade itself they rust it's mm -hmm. a high carbon steel so they rust but when you take a sword out not as a martial arts person but if you're taking it out to look at it You take it out cutting edge up, you open, they have a push button, these guntos, a lot of times you push the button, pull it out, and then you slide it out gently, and it comes out almost like a train on a railroad track, it, it rolls out almost. Mm -hmm. um, and then you look at the sword, a lot of times you'll take a rag, rest it under the blade, um, and look at the different features of the temper line and the grain. Um, you got to be really careful because they are, they're like razor blades. Mm -hmm. um, we've had people at shows cut themselves and cut arteries. Um, and then when you're returning it back, you rest the point at the throat of the scabbard, the koguchi, and just gently slide it in and it rolls back in. Um, and that's the proper way to take them in and out. Never touch the blade. You, you're technically not supposed to speak over the blade while you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm about to drop it on the floor. That's interesting, thank you. Um, and uh, there is a special box here. Yeah, these are these are Scottish skindus. Um, and most of these were made from... Sure, sure. Most of these were made um, in the Victorian area, like 1870s, 1880s. Um, but there are some in here that are older, like this one is from the 1700s. Mm. Um, you know, and then they, they gradually progress older or newer as they get older, up to about 1880, right? Is about the latest one you have in there. All these items are uh, military guys? Well, they, they're pipe, they're Scottish They're, they're the stocking knives that the, that the Scottish wore in their sock mm -hmm. or hid in their sock. Yeah, it was kind of a concealed weapon. They used them for everything, though. Mm. Black knife, yeah, skin do. But some of them are quite nice. Um, you can see the prices on them. Typically, they'll have a caragorn or smoky quartz. 
A lot of times the silver is hallmarked. And I uh, read about the stone. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it means uh, part of mother land uh, mm -hmm. with them. Yeah, so I mean it was, they were... It's more a symbolic. Yeah, very symbolic. And and these these style knives go back to yeah medieval times maybe even earlier. Mm -hmm. But they're they're razor sharp. I mean they really are. We had a guy cut himself at one of our tables with with one of these, and he was bleeding really bad. Uh, but they can be quite elaborate. Yeah, like for instance, this one, the leather. Because it was close to the skin, mm -hmm. the leather virtually rotted off. On the top of your table, you have a glitch. Glitch. Yeah. Yeah, and it's Turkish. Um, probably 1700s. Uh, Damascus blade. So these were, uh, this one is Turkish, but it's a traditional Islamic sword. Um, it's called a Mameluk. The blade style is called a Mameluk. The Marine Corps actually adopted that sword sword style um, in the early 1800s, probably after they encountered the uh, the the mother Muslim fighters in North Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing that it was a pretty formidable weapon. Um, but they have a they have an Islamic uh, saying on the blade. Mm -hmm. Usually in gold or silver. Okay, and uh, did you translate it? I have. I haven't. Okay, but it very interesting. Yeah. Yep. Um, this okay. this is this is the koshiri for a koshirai for a much older sword. Um, these mounts are higo, higo traditional higo style mounts. Actually, super quality. If you can you can macro in on on the tsuba and the. Try. Fuchikashira. Mm -hmm. Really quite quite good. And this steel? Yeah, iron. Yep. Iron with gill. Have a look at that. Yep. And there's a there's a dragon. Cloud dragons is the motif. Mm -hmm. um, and everything matches from top to bottom. And what period is it? Uh, the mounts are Edo period, probably 16, 1700s, maybe early 1700s. All of the parts are matching. I'm missing the Kozuka and Kogai, which would be pretty hard to get, pretty hard to find in that exact motif. Mm -hmm. But the lacquer is almost in perfect condition. This lacquer is 300 years old. It's um, very nice. And, and this and sword, this, it, um, this this blade and koshirai is twenty one thousand. It's it has a replica of the actual sword made. We when we send them to Japan and have them restored, they make a replica of the blade in Howood Hanoki, and that's what holds the koshirai together. Mm -hmm. um, and then here's the actual blade, which I sent over for polish and paper to the sword museum. It says Rai Kunizane. Mm -hmm. um, that's who made this made this or they attributed it actually to a smith which is a little unusual today um, uh, the former director of the sword museum does what they call um, sayagaki where he describes the blade what it is the length and then he signs it on the bottom mr it's mr tanabe is sayagaki um, and he's describing the features of the blade. But this blade was actually made about 1280, I think is when this guy worked. Um, he was one of the last of the rye smiths. Um, and this is what the sword looks like after after polish. Mm -hmm. You send it to... You send it to Japan and then... Um, you specify, you know, obviously. I, what I do is I direct where I want it to go. Um, I have specific polishers that I like. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And then the horses. Notice the horses on the on the on the habaki. I actually wanted it. Usually you have a new habaki made, but I wanted to keep this one because of the the horses. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the original owner probably was a horseman, and so horses were important to him. So he kept, you know, he had a little honorific engraving on his habaku. And this one is really old. Mm -hmm. And a lot nice. of times, older swords will, will have been shortened. I'll actually take the handle off here. Um, and when they shorten them, they shorten them from the, the back side of the sword. Um, they lost the signature. The signature on this sword would have probably been around here. Mm -hmm. And if you, you look down, you can kind of see the natural curvature of the blade. If you look at the where the where the ridge of the Nakago, where it goes. So yeah. most of the curvature was probably back towards the back of the blade, which is characteristic of an older mm -hmm. sword. So now you can understand why so many swords have are not signed or have lost their signature because they've been shortened. Um, once in a while, you'll see a sword where they'll take the signature and cut it into a panel and inlay it into the Nakago. Mm -hmm. um, they'll also sometimes fold the, the very end of the Nakago over where the signature is, and it'll be upside down folded into the, the Nakago. They'll cut a little, a mm -hmm. little cutout for it and actually push it down into there. Bill, I would like to ask you about these uh, banners. Yeah, these are uh, trumpet banners and drum skirts in the upper mm -hmm. upper portion of the case. Um, sorry, it's a little noisy because it's the end of the show. Yeah. Um, these are. This is actually an Algamine SS trumpet banner underneath an Adolf Hitler presentation frame, silver frame. Mm -hmm. um, he gave these to his his friends and uh, important people in, in Germany mm -hmm. uh, with a little signature and saying he's he's happy that for something or whatever. And, um, but this particular trumpet banner was for uh, an SS group, SSOA Rhine, um, and they were in that Rhine region. Um, the embroidery on these is pretty, pretty much the same. <laughs> Um, in all of them, and on the back they have the, the SS ruins. And then this one, these are SS trumpet banners. These are pre-1937 um, with the early style eagle. Um, and then the SS ruins on back. Mm -hmm. And um, how much? Are... Um, these, these are uh, the three. I have a matching set of three. I have a drum skirt and two trumpet banners. These are like 40,000, this one's 40,000 for mm -hmm. just the one. Okay. Um, these are a more desirable pattern. Everybody recognizes these. Yeah, because of its very interesting and rare trophies. Yeah, so. these actually, interesting story about these. These came from originally, a US general had brought these back as a souvenir mm -hmm. um, from World War II and he, he Sometime in the late 70s, he bought a plantation in, in uh, Guatemala. Um, and in, in the early 80s, and I think 1981, he was murdered by leftist guerrillas um, when they raided his estate. Um, and a friend of his bought them, or ended up with them, and I bought them from him just about a year ago. No. Uh, along with a bunch of other stuff and some of the general's personal artifacts. Okay. Um, so you never know where you're going to find some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, I bought Japanese swords out of Argentina. Mm, really? Yeah. So. That's interesting. Okay. Thank you very much for thank your you. explain. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, have safe trip home. Thank and, you. And uh, have a good day. You too. Thanks.